Hello everybody and welcome back to All Practice, where we want to do some good and stuff. Finally, I got it done. This is the video on politics, specifically through the lens of the All Practice worldview. What that is, is something that I described in another video. I will leave a link in the description. So, before we get started, I would like to humbly request your full attention. This isn't the type of video to watch at a red light or while you're having a quick little BM. So, pause. Go make yourself some popcorn or a sandwich, get comfy, and then let's get into it. In this video, I'm taking a little bit more of an academic approach. I'd give myself a C plus or a B minus. They could definitely use a little bit of cleaning up, but whatever, it gets the point across. And I made an outline so it's easier to follow and understand. And I also numbered a lot of my references. So you can look in the description and click on the news stories that I reference and whatnot and and you can dive a little deeper if you want, and as always, I encourage you, please, if you want to say something, leave a comment, or go on Twitter, and say something there. Thank you very much. Let's go. The United States of America. Yeah, not so united these days. The U.S. used to have a reputation of credibility and progressiveness. Her citizens used to be the most highly educated and well-rounded population on the planet. Not anymore. The United States is the laughing stock of the world and seems to be regressing into a third world nation. The politicians don't serve the people. The news media is an epic failure. Social media is a war zone of sass and ignorance. COVID-19 kills more people every day than 9-11 and half the country doesn't care. Most of the other half of the country is too aloof to do anything about it. Food and housing insecurity is on the rise. Classism, racism, violence, and plain old stupidity is making a comeback with a vengeance. Yet the stock market is doing better than it ever has. Why? The government of the United States and its supportive institutions have no credibility. The rights of the American people are severely and continually eroded. The elected parties serve the people only as a pretext to their true role as enablers of the uber-wealthy class. As an ongoing result of emotional manipulation, Americans overpay for goods and services. Social mobility is virtually non-existent, and democracy itself is in peril. The only solution to these problems is to follow the general principles of the L-Practice worldview. Before I get started, I should explain what my worldview is. My previous video explains it, but here's a quick clarification. The subtext of the L-Practice worldview basically says facts and science are the path to legitimacy. And there are generally two types of people, high-minded and low-minded. High-minded people spend more and more energy building complex systems of understanding in their effort to grow. High-minded people will adjust their outlook based on evidence and facts so they maintain credibility and efficacy. Manipulating the high-minded by appealing to their base emotions is difficult because they base their emotions on legitimacy and facts. Low-minded people have stagnant mindsets, are not receptive to new ideas. They serve their impulses and reject things outside their zone of familiarity. Being low-minded is fine. People should live how they want. However, the low-minded are easily manipulated because they base their decisions on emotional impulses. When discussing serious things like climate change or doing something important, like serving in public, only high-minded people have the potential to maintain credibility. A high-minded person in a crisis will rely on training, address professionals, etc., etc., and adjust their viewpoint and move ahead. A low-minded person in a crisis will act on instinct. For example, a low-minded person would throw water on a grease fire because that action is reactionary. Being low-minded does not mean someone is a bad person. However, people who manipulate the predictable behavior of the low-minded with ill will or selfish intent are dangerous for society. This type of person should not be trusted to serve others. Now, let's take a look at today's political situation through the lens of this worldview. Looking at the government of the United States, with the aforementioned concepts of credibility and high-low-mindedness in hand, it has no credibility to the people and essentially serves the uber-wealthy. This disservice continues because Americans at large are manipulated through arguments that appeal to their base emotions. I'm going to break it down into three branches. Let's start at the top with the executive branch, where I'll focus on the last three presidents. I'm only going to focus on them because they are the most directly responsible for shaping the situation we are in today, and because they are from the time in which I've been politically conscious. 
First up, Donald Trump. Donald Trump's third world style of leadership highlights his tactic of appealing to the base emotions of Americans. Trump claims he is chosen by God. He claims he is fighting against widespread corruption. Aside from the bullshit that just went down in DC, Trump's handling of the coronavirus situation may be the most clear example of his lack of credibility. Freedom of religion is an American value because history shows us that religious governments are violent and don't care much for freedom. The first colonizers of this land came here because they were fleeing oppressive religious rule. Religion is part of many Americans' identity. Thus, it resonates very deeply with their emotions and loyalties. Donald Trump has claimed he is the chosen one and relishes in claims of his divinity. He accuses his political opponents of being anti-God, etc., etc. This situation is extremely dangerous because history shows strongly religious people often radicalize and become unreasonable, violent, etc., etc. People have claimed they are ready to die for Trump. Looking at what happened in the Capitol building, they are serious. Trump capitalizes on the primal emotion of anger in Americans' hearts by posturing himself as a champion against corruption. I think it is safe to say that the vast majority of Americans think the government is riddled with corruption and they are angry with this situation. People voted for Obama because he said he would, quote, change the status quo. More on that later. People voted for Trump because he said he would drain the swamp and because he is a, quote, political outsider. The idea that Trump fights corruption is simply untrue. There are many ways to prove this, but I am only going to use one example to make my case. It's a doozy. The official election defense fund is a scam. It is marketed as an effort to fund the Georgia recounts and flip the election results at large. However, only a small percentage of the money raised will go to these efforts. Most of the money collected will go to the GOP itself, pay down Trump's campaign debts, and go to Trump's new PAC, Save America. Good old American snake oil. It's ironic how the fund's donors think they are combating corruption when they are literally paying into it, especially so considering people have been chanting destroy the GOP at Trump rallies. <laughs> Got he! Here, Trump is again appealing to the anger in people's hearts, not their brains. Quote, election defense and quote, save America on the surface seem like good things. A bit of objective research shows how those titles are just manipulations. Arguably. The most severe example of Trump's lack of credibility is in his handling of COVID-19. Now, more Americans die per day from the virus than 9-11. In the US, the death toll is surpassing 360,000. Due to his tribalist rhetoric and corrupt legislation, his followers don't believe the deadly consequences of not social distancing or wearing masks, and wealth disparity is accelerating. One of the jobs of the US president is to mitigate the effects of a crisis not worsen them. Conclusively, Trump is a classic example of a tyrant. There is no way I can convey the severity of his threat to democracy. Books will be written about the things he has done and the people he has inspired for a hundred years. He appeals to people's fear and anger to suppress his opponents. He has no credibility because he encourages lawlessness and willful ignorance. He is supposed to defend the people and the constitution, yet he inspired a riot that resulted in an attack on the Capitol building when Congress was in session. That didn't even happen during the Civil War. There are many other examples of Trump's self-serving manipulations, but it seems no matter what happens, Wall Street continues to break records. That's why it's time to move on to the other side of the coin. Now, let's talk about how Barack Hussein Obama used many of the same tricks to betray the trust of the public and serve Wall Street investors. First off, I want to say that I am proud that the citizens of this country finally elected an African American to the highest office. What Barack Obama did was one of the greatest achievements in history. However, sadly, I think that was his only real achievement. Honestly, I don't know if Obama failed to achieve what he wanted to do or if he was working for the banks and CEOs the whole time. Ultimately, it doesn't matter because what's done is done. He won the election because he appealed to the hope in people's hearts by saying he was going to change the status quo and take the country back from bankers and CEOs, etc., etc. He appealed to the goodness in people's hearts by saying he would bring affordable health care, social justice, and end the wars in the Middle East. Epic failure. Barack Obama reinforced the status quo. He showed the banks and CEOs are above the law. He cowed to the thuggery of Mitch McConnell and allowed the GOP to radicalize into a third world party. And 
He reinvented the wars in the Middle East by allowing the rise of ISIS. Thanks, Obama. Obama appealed to the hope and angst in people's hearts by saying he would provide affordable health care and advance social justice. His method worked, and he won the presidency. However, he failed to deliver on his promises. Yes, the people have health care, but we Americans are so used to getting ripped off, we don't understand how expensive and low quality our health care is. The OECD is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Its members and partners make up 80% of world trade and investment. The U.S., the richest country ever, spends almost twice the share of its GDP on health care than the average OECD country. And the U.S. has the highest rates of chronic disease, obesity, and the lowest life expectancy. Not so good for the people. Very good for the investors. Thanks, Obama. Again, Obama appealed to the hope and sense of justice in people's hearts by saying he would take the country back from the bankers and the CEOs. That did not happen. Many Americans and people around the world lost their livelihoods due to the 2008 financial meltdown. Obama did what he was obligated to do by bailing out the necessary banks and industries so the country could keep running. But nobody was held liable for the actions that caused the meltdown in the first place. Thanks, Obama. The most expensive thing in history is the American military. Look it up yourself. The numbers are staggering. Many Americans are upset at how much it costs, and they are upset with perpetual war in the Middle East. Obama appealed to these people by saying he would end the wars and eventually withdraw American forces. As is American tradition, politics made the war foobar. The only thing Obama really did was introduce drone warfare. Obviously, it didn't change much. ISIS became the new big scary threat, so there's that. Thanks, Obama. Mitch McConnell was more powerful than Obama, and he set the tone for the GOP until they radicalized into the Third Reich under His Majesty Donald Trump. I'm going to summarize here because everything I'm saying is available for anyone to look up, and because I know I'm not going to convince anybody who already has a position. Obama would bring up the data, science, and other facts concerning whatever thing he was trying to do as president. Mitch McConnell and the GOP would say they don't believe Obama. That's it. End of conversation. It happened over and over again. Was it failure? Or was it an act all along? Honestly, I don't know. Obviously, Wall Street got what they wanted, though. Like I said earlier, what's done is done. The audacity of hope indeed. Now, it's time to move on to the guy who everybody thought was the dumbest president in history until 2016 happened. I like to call him BJ, but everyone else calls him W. George W. Bush. I don't really remember what Bush campaigned on, like most Americans. I didn't give a shit about politics or the rest of the world until 9-11. Looking through the lens of the El Practice worldview, 9-11 was the perfect opportunity for politicians who wanted to manipulate public interest. Americans were shocked, and they could be made angry given the right push. The Bush administration, led by Dick Cheney, capitalized on this situation and manufactured evidence to go to war in Iraq. The New York Times, with all its journalistic integrity and prestige, was happy to convince Americans about the dangers of yellow cake and aluminum rods. The motherfucker bought some yellow cake, okay, in Africa. He went to Africa and he bought yellow cake. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure, bitch. Side note, the New York Times is still full of shit, but I'll get back to that later. The rest is history and current events. The war continues to this day. Bush and Cheney were untouchable. Bush was elected to a second term because he appealed to the wrathful hearts of righteous Americans by saying he was fighting evildoers abroad. He was able to award no-bid contracts, which essentially are blank checks to contractors of his choosing. Conflicts of interest and credibility be damned. Dick Cheney shot a lawyer in the face, and the lawyer apologized to Cheney and his family, saying he was sorry for causing trouble. There was no legitimate investigation. Absolute lawlessness. Such is the legacy of the United States presidency, Republican and Democrat alike. They tell us about good, evil, hope, and justice, and then we fall in love. Then, they give the fruits of our sweat and blood away for privilege and market gains. I see no other explanation. Well, that wraps it up for the L-Practice worldview on the executive branch. On to Congress! It's no secret the United States Congress is messed up. Here, 
I'm mostly going to focus on the performance Congress has done as a whole, how it has been an utter failure to the people it is supposed to serve, and how it neglects the duties it is supposed to perform. The United States Congress has no credibility because it barely passes any bills, and the most important bills aren't even read by the members of Congress before they vote on them. Through the use of lobbyists, Congress works in favor of whoever has the most money. One of the jobs Congress has is to pass regulations. Let's look at just a few important examples. Companies like Facebook, Amazon, Google, etc. are out of control. They build profiles on individuals by using information from personal emails, texts, pictures, etc. They access microphones on personal devices to listen to what you are saying, and they even use the camera to watch your eyes and micro-expressions while you read and watch videos. They take this information and sell it. In 2016, the Trump campaign paid Facebook to target potential Democratic voters with misinformation. This effort was successful in its aim to suppress the vote. Here, the lack of regulation has led to the monetization of people's private lives and has damaged our democratic society. Amazon is owned by the richest guy in the history of the earth, Jeff Bezos. Uh, it's Elon Musk now, but whatever. He enjoys an extremely low tax rate, while his employees are on welfare, with no medical insurance, and face ridiculously stressful working conditions. Congress has failed to regulate in other areas as well. Obviously, the environment. I think this is the issue that is the most important. Period. The air we breathe, the water we drink, the land we live on, the lives of all the creatures on this planet. There's so much to say here. I'm not going to say anything. Information on this is freely available to anyone who cares to look. What do you think when you hear the word pharmaceutical? I think about people's health, how they deal with pain, and the importance of quality medical care. Congress allows pharmaceutical companies to market their products like candy. The advertisements are ridiculous. I'm just a wannabe YouTuber, but I know it is the truth when I say doctors should be the ones in control of what drugs are needed for whatever condition, if at all. The repetitive, vague commercials with the directive to ask your doctor are a disservice. I understand we live in a capitalist society, but snicker bars and drugs are not the same thing. And yes, I'm going to bring up Oxycontin. That one drug is a pandemic on its own. Like millions of other Americans, I have lost friends and family to Oxycontin. I have seen the thievery, crime, and violence that surround that drug. And it's a gateway to heroin, meth, and that whole world. It's been going on for decades, and it's there for everyone to see. Addicts are everywhere in America. What an epic failure. Another important job Congress is supposed to do is to act as a check of power on the other branches of government. Alas, it has failed here, too. Congress's lack of credibility is highlighted by two things. The fact that it willfully and intentionally ignored facts and evidence during the impeachment of President Trump. And secondly, the last three judges that have been confirmed to the Supreme Court have been confirmed under dubious and arguably illegal circumstances. It has been proven that the 2016 presidential election was subject to interference by foreign powers. Robert Mueller was appointed special counsel to investigate that interference. In that investigation, Mueller and his team discovered evidence that Trump and many of his associates committed crimes. Trump and his associates lied to the special counsel during the investigation, resulting in obstruction charges. A bunch of Trump's people went to jail, and Trump himself got impeached. During the impeachment trial, Republicans, the majority party in the Senate, voted to exclude much of the evidence the special counsel found. That is the kind of stuff third world courts do. We all know the outcome. Roughly six months before the end of Obama's second term, a spot on the Supreme Court opened up. The Constitution says that the sitting president chooses a nominee, and the Senate confirms them. The GOP stonewalled the whole process, mostly by saying the spot should be filled by the next president because the vacancy opened up so close to the election. I see some logic there, but that is not what the Constitution dictates, and as usual, Democrats cowed and let Obama lose his pick. Trump became president, and he nominated Gorsuch, a shill for big business, and the Senate confirmed him. In 2018, another spot opened on the Supreme Court. Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh, and this pick turned out to be a bit of a controversy. During the confirmation process, 
and a display of anger and paranoia. Cavana scrunched up his face and shouted about some Fox News Clinton family conspiracy theories. All judges, especially Supreme Court justices, are expected to act separate from their personal emotions and keep a cool head at all times. This is a direct concern of the L practice worldview. Keeping the prefrontal cortex engaged at all times is the only way to maintain credibility. Kavanaugh lost emotional control because of a few questions he knew were coming. To be honest, I don't like the Clintons very much either, but not for the reasons Fox News outlines on their whack job shows. In a display of complete disregard for their duties, the Senate confirmed him. In 2020, yet another spot opened on the Supreme Court, this time just two months from the election. The Republicans contradicted themselves and now argued that no matter how close to an election, the sitting president chooses who fills Supreme Court vacancies. Again, as usual, the Democrats caved, and just six weeks before the election, the Senate confirmed Amy Coney Barrett, a religious extremist, to the Supreme Court. Turns out she failed to disclose all sorts of important information during the confirmation process, but she was confirmed anyway. These three Third World-style confirmations highlight how little credibility Congress has. It's no secret that the United States Congress is full of demonstratively irresponsible people. But I'm going to limit myself to two hit jobs here. To be fair, one on either side of the aisle. Leatherface, aka Frail Bones McGee, aka Moscow, Mitch McConnell, and America's Nana, Dianne Feinstein. Mitch McConnell is the Senate Majority Leader, and during his tenure, he has made it clear that he is happy to be called the Grim Reaper. He has been dubbed so because he has halted an extraordinary amount of legislation from progressing into law. He kills bills, they say. This man is proud to be known for being antithetical to the job he was elected to do. The oldest senator, and one of the most powerful Democrats, Dianne Feinstein, has repeatedly shown she cannot handle her duties anymore. During official proceedings, she has shown she forgets things instantly, and there is a growing list of other examples of her cognitive decline. Some people keep their wits their entire life, some don't. Flatly, she's not qualified to hold such an important, difficult position in public service. Just these two alone, and the fact that they are leaders in Congress, highlight the void of credibility Americans are forced to endure. There is much more that can be said about Congress and its lack of credibility. I'm only going to dance around one more thing and then move on. Income. The current income disparity situation in the United States is the second most clear-cut example of the government's servitude to the rich. And the acceleration of this disparity during the COVID crisis vividly demonstrates Congress's neglect of its duties. I am only going to use one hard piece of data to drive my point. At the start of COVID, the 650 richest American citizens had an average wealth 400,000 times greater than the poorest 165 million citizens. Today, that ratio has increased to 500,000 to 1. I'm going to try to do an animation to visualize this. Astounding. By no means am I a contemporary conservative, but I do have some actual conservatism running through my veins. I believe some people are destined to be poor because they are lazy, etc., etc., and that is a popular position among so-called conservatives. However, to say the poorest 165 million American citizens are poor because they don't work hard or whatever is flat out wrong. This is thievery. Rich people and companies have the money to lobby Congress, and as a result, they pay a minuscule ratio of their income to taxes. And whenever Congress gets the chance, they give the rich more and more handouts. The COVID stimulus bills are no exception. Massive amounts of money go to people and companies that don't need it or spend it in a way that doesn't help with the crisis. On December 30, 2020, under pressure to send $2,000 payments to people making less than $75,000 a year, Moscow Mitch said there has been enough stimulus. Up to 40 million people are facing eviction and even more are facing financial ruin due to the COVID crisis. My income has been reduced by 75% since the start of the COVID crisis, and I had to move back in with my fucking mother in some shithole New Hampshire city, and now I spend a third of my income paying for the gas I need to commute to work in Boston. I'm semi-fucked already, and my debt is growing, but I am surviving. If gas prices shoot up, or if my Honda breaks down, I'm fully fucked. 
relatively anyway. There are people who have it way worse than me, and my heart hurts for them. I can only imagine. But let me get back on track here. Congress is an utter failure. It doesn't check and balance the powers of the other branches. It doesn't regulate crucially important sectors. It barely passes any legislation. And whatever does get passed dramatically increases disparity. It's embarrassing to talk about Congress with people from other nations. Our representatives are clowns. People defy congressional subpoenas and nothing happens. What a joke. That said, it's time to move on and talk about everybody's favorite branch of government to not talk about. The judicial branch. Court's adjourned. <laughs> to paraphrase, John Adams said the United States government has a government of laws, not men. Lady Justice, a symbol of American law, is blind and holds a scale because the law is supposed to be applied to everyone evenly, no matter what. Today, the American justice system has strayed far from John Adams' vision and the principles behind the image of Lady Justice. As a whole, the United States justice system has no credibility. Rich people and companies operate above the law. Donald Trump is above the law. The police are politicized and out of control. And when it comes to legal issues, the rest of us have to live with systematic classism and racism. It is easy to demonstrate how rich people are above the law. It is common knowledge that they get off easy. Here, I'm only going to use one example to make my case because the implications of this example are so severe, it's obvious the justice system is broken. On November 24, 2020, Purdue Pharma pled guilty to charges related to the ongoing opioid epidemic. This company admitted to lying to the DEA about OxyContin being sold on the streets, and they admitted to providing false market information to the DEA as a tactic to justify larger manufacturing quotas. Purdue Pharma admitted to bribing doctors to write more OxyContin prescriptions, and they admitted to bribing a medical records company to forward patient information that would encourage even more doctors to prescribe OxyContin. As a result, as of today, over 250,000 Americans have died because of these actions, specifically. Nothing is mentioned about the millions of people who are still addicted and are actively ruining the lives of other people. Nothing was said about the people who transitioned to heroin and other hardcore drugs because they couldn't get the Oxycontin anymore. Nothing was said about the crime and extreme violence that surrounds opioids. Purdue Pharma, which is owned and operated by the Sackler family, has been fined $8.3 billion. Through a process of bullshit legal trickery, the company and the family are expected to pay up to only $225 million each, something they can easily afford. No jail time for anyone. Members of the Sackler family have acknowledged their role in the opioid epidemic, yet they refuse to publicly apologize. This is an outrageous failure of justice and a betrayal of the American people. This is just the latest greatest example of how the United States justice system retains zero credibility to the people it is supposed to serve. People and institutions have let their impulses and loyalties override their ability to reason, behave, and fulfill their duties. The facts are the facts, though. Donald Trump is a criminal, yet no departments or courts are holding him responsible. I'm not a lawyer, so I'm going to use a few widely reported examples to highlight Trump's criminality that have no wiggle room where I could have misinterpreted. Trump used campaign funds to pay Stormy Daniels to be quiet about their affair. He did this to prevent damage to his chances of winning the 2016 presidential election. That is illegal. Trump has violated the emoluments clause in the Constitution maybe hundreds of times. This law basically says that a government official cannot use their position to garner titles, gifts, money, etc. Trump has used his own hotels, clubs, etc. to host government officials and functions many times. There are reports of his businesses price gouging when they are used by the government as well. According to the Emoluments Clause, this is flat out illegal. It is a federal offense to encourage other people to commit a federal offense. On September 3, 2020, Trump made his first in a series of tweets that encouraged people in North Carolina to vote twice in the presidential election. The tweet was recognized as illegal immediately. If American justice was blind and fair, Trump would be in jail right now for any one of these things. There is much more that he has done that is flat out illegal and much, much more that is evidence of illegal activity. Now, 
I'm about to piss some people off. I'm going to say some shit. Then say but. Then say some real shit. I believe the police are a necessary part of any civil society. Honor and sacrifice should be acknowledged. But, seriously, the police in America are out of control. It's a tradition and the duty of the American public to criticize the government. So, I'm going to do just that. The evidence I'm about to refer to could be argued as anecdotal, but make your own decision. There are dozens of YouTube channels of people who call themselves cop watchers or First Amendment auditors. A few videos show the police being professional and honorable of the oaths they take. However, the vast majority of videos show how militarized and combative the police are and how the First, Second, Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments of the Constitution are basically ignored. Contrary to popular belief, legally, the police are not meant to serve and protect. The role of the police is to enforce the law, and the Constitution is law. In these videos, when people take a stand for their constitutional rights, it seems the police get really pissed off. The professionalism of these channels varies greatly. However, there is one channel I found to be very formal and quite literally by the book. Audit the Audit is a YouTube channel with videos that scrutinize citizens' interactions with the police through the lens of actual state, federal, and case law. Whoever runs Audit the Audit really does their homework. It's also just really fun to watch the drama unfold. The whole thin blue line debacle is concerning as well. It supposedly represents the idea that the police are the thin line that prevents society from descending into violent chaos. I find that idea to be shallow and ironic considering all the bullshit that has been happening lately. The Massachusetts State Police refused to hold their people accountable for widespread overtime fraud. And the Boston Globe released a report that reveals how officers who are proven to be excessively violent go unpunished and are patrolling the streets today. It turns out certain officers in the Massachusetts State Police are friends with drug dealers and illegal gamblers and even do them favors like running background checks and stuff. The report also reveals the Massachusetts State Police routinely lie to investigators and even judges. This is insane. Beyond all this, what really concerns me is the fact that police helped the insurrectionists when they stormed the Capitol building on January 6th. Horrifying. This is being investigated now. It's also said that the thin blue line represents an homage to the sacrifices the police make in the line of duty, and people should respect that. I understand this, but the police aren't forced to be police. They're volunteers. If some cops feel like victims, or if they're afraid to do their job, they should get a new job. If a cop wakes up in the morning and dons the thin blue line flag instead of the American flag, they are not fit to be a cop. Looking at everything that is happening with politics and the police, to me, the thin blue line flag is the same as the Confederate flag. There is much more that can be said about the problems with the judicial branch, especially about racism. But I think I laid down a good baseline. And there are generations of public records, literature, music, and poetry that detail these problems better than I can. It's up to you to look. Next, I'll be talking about the institutions that support the works of the United States government, the media, the American Bar Association, and the education system. The media is sometimes referred to as the fourth branch of government because it has the ability to sway public opinion and the government supposedly makes decisions based on public opinion. So, the media is a very influential part of our society. And because of that, those with power seek to use it for their ends. Journalistic integrity is virtually non-existent. Mainstream media companies are essentially pro-establishment feedback loops that repeat things until people believe them. Most of the content these companies produce is based on emotional banter, not hard fact from credible sources. NPR and the New York Times are widely considered to be more reliable, professional news sources, but they too are platforms for the establishment that operate under the guise of academic credibility, objectivity, etc. Beyond that, social media has risen as a widely relied upon source of news. Since most of the content on social media is produced by regular citizens who are not officials of any capacity, the vast majority of social media content is unreliable as news and is often very low-minded, especially considering the largest social media company, Facebook, actively feeds the low-minded paranoia and impulses of its users by shoveling emotions-based and violent content into view. Before I show some evidence for what I just said, let me explain what I mean by establishment. It's kind of a loaded term. 
The establishment is nonpartisan. It is not liberal and it is not conservative. The military budget, health care, banks, mainstream media, law enforcement, the unfair redundancy of sales and income tax, career politicians, Wall Street, and companies like Amazon, Facebook, Tyson, BP, ExxonMobil, etc. are all things that could be considered establishment. These are institutions that are flush with money and power, yet they face little or no effective scrutiny as they continue to fail to operate within the norms and ideals we are all supposed to live by. I would like to explain more, but it has taken me way too long to make this video already, so I'm going to carry on. Comment or tweet me if you want to discuss what the establishment is. Mainstream media has no credibility because the content it offers is essentially a closed feedback loop and it lacks journalistic integrity. All the mainstream media companies like CNN, MSNBC, Fox, etc. report on the same stories and their talking heads interview each other and make no real journalistic progress. We're extremely proud of the quality, balanced journalism that CBS4 News produces. But we are concerned about trouble and trying to be responsible one-sided news stories plaguing our country. Plaguing our country. The sharing of biased and false news has become all too common on social media. More alarming, some media outlets publish the same fake stories without checking facts first. The sharing of biased and false, false news, news has, has become, become all too common on, on social, social media. media. More alarming, some media even the cute little feel-good stories are the same. The last one I remember is about the guy who saved his puppy from a gator or something. Cute. I don't care. In fact, I would have been more entertained if I saw the gator eat the puppy. Fuck that puppy. Every network played that story for like a week. What they don't report on speaks more loudly than what they do. They never truly criticized the establishment. The mainstream media was quiet about the warning signs economic professionals were talking about leading up to the 2008 recession. Reporting on the wars overseas used to be cool, but these days, not a peep. One station says something, and they all repeat it. Remember when Al Gore was called the winner of the presidential race in 2000, and all the networks spread the news, and they all had to do corrections? Such a void of integrity. Fox News differs only slightly because they found a profitable market and they committed to it. In the few times Fox News has been taken to court for their shenanigans, they argue that they shouldn't be expected to tell the truth. They aren't even trying to have integrity. Other than their appeal to the far right, Fox is the same as CNN and all the others. People have quantified what I'm saying here in a much more succinct way. And I implore you to look into it yourself. NPR and the New York Times are known for being much more professional and credible, but this perception only deepens the irony of their lack of credibility. NPR is a staunch defender of the establishment. I'll admit, NPR is one of the best sources of hard facts and in-depth interviews, but sadly, the people they choose to interview almost always support the establishment. There's one example sticking in my head that drives this point from one of NPR's sister channels, BPR, Boston Public Radio. As the 2020 election results came in, Alexandria Oscario Cortez made a few points on Twitter detailing how progressives were being blamed for Democrat losses, despite the fact progressives gained seats and didn't lose any. On November 9, 2020, one of Joe Biden's deputy campaign managers, Rufus Gifford, was a guest on BPR, and the points he made about the election were direct counterpoints to what AOC said on Twitter. And the most telling thing about the interview was how nobody mentioned her name. Jim Brody and Marjorie Egan along with Biden's deputy campaign manager, did what Trump would call a political hit job. If they had journalistic integrity, they would have mentioned AOC's comments and given her due credit before they attacked her points. That is how journalism works. But AOC represents a threat to the establishment, so she faces some of the same obstacles Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang face. In this case, a media blackout. NPR and all the others like to talk about Beto O'Rourke and Joe Biden and Kamala Harris because they are people who won't push for serious change. People like AOC, Andrew Yang, and Bernie Sanders, and the points they talk about, are simply ignored by NPR and its circle of pompous, award-winning journalists. NPR, I would say, is the high bar for news content, but sadly, that bar is quite low, and the New York Times is in a position lower than NPR. Yes, the New York Times does break some good news here and there, but they have absolutely no problem selling massive lies to the public and their servers to the establishment. Do the words yellow cake or aluminum rods ring a bell? Back from Africa, 
cradle of fucking civilization. And this nigga out here buying yellow cake from the motherland. Are you sure it was yellow cake? Y'all niggas don't believe me. I got some yellow cake right here. Look, you see, you believe this shit now? Y'all drop that I shit. I didn't know I... The New York Times convinced the American public it was necessary to go to war in Iraq by lying about WMDs on behalf of the Bush administration. And as usual, all the other major news outlets repeated these lies for years because journalistic integrity is a myth. Yeah, that was decades ago, but America is still fighting that very same war funneling hundreds of billions of dollars into the pockets of companies that are good at lobbying. Looking at global stability today, I don't see that war ending anytime soon. The New York Times is still up to the same old tricks. In 2020, they had to retract most of their podcast series, Caliphate, because they didn't vet any information again. The editors admit to falling in love with the story, and thanks to the L-Practice worldview, we all know emotions have no place in any effort that requires professionalism and diligence. That excuse is bullshit anyway. It's a confirmed pattern of behavior. The goal here was to romanticize war and to keep it justifiable in the minds of the public. Now, let's move on to the absolute bottom of the barrel of toxic sludge, Facebook. Facebook is an extraordinarily unhealthy thing for individuals and the public at large. It is the most brazen tool of the establishment with its data harvesting and the ability to manipulate public consensus. Facebook actively pushes people to embrace a low-minded, impulsive, emotional disposition. They do this by allowing political ads and commentary that is straight-up fake and hostile, and by showing its users a mind-numbing stream of violent, bigoted, tribalist content. Because of this, I'll practice will never be on Facebook. However, I personally have a Facebook account because it is the best way to keep tabs on family, and Facebook Marketplace is very convenient. Yep, I'm a hypocrite. Never said I was perfect. Sometimes, when I have a few minutes to kill, I'll scroll to the video section. This is the stuff that I see. It disgusts and offends me to the core, yet I am entertained. Because of my nature and my worldview, my opinions and outlook are not really affected by this lore to the dark side but I see how people who don't understand the importance of skepticism are. Stuff like this is why civility in America is going down the shitter. There are a lot of lawyers involved in the process of government. There are rules of conduct lawyers are supposed to follow, set forth mostly by the American Bar Association, because of the importance of what they do. However, looking at the actions of some high-profile lawyers, it has become obvious these rules are not fully enforced. Thus, this is another situation where the United States government loses credibility. The lies Rudy Giuliani and other Trump lawyers boldly tell should result in their disbarment, at a minimum. Back in 2019, during the Ukraine scandal, Giuliani was vigorously defending Trump, which raised questions whether he was working for him or not. He told The Atlantic he is, quote, not working for Trump, but also, at other times, he claimed he had attorney-client privilege in regards to the details around the debacle. This is a clear-cut violation of the conduct rules lawyers are supposed to obey. This is just one small example of Giuliani's misconduct, yet this alone should get him disbarred. I think the most telling example of how the American Bar Association refuses to enforce its own rules took place during Trump's impeachment. Trump's defense team, led by Pat Cipollone and Jay Sucklow, told lie after lie throughout the impeachment process. And they weren't slick about it either. The things they said were obviously and demonstratively wrong. They were under oath as well. They defied the rules of the American Bar Association and lied under oath. They should be in jail. Nothing happened. Stuff like this is a clear sign to bad actors that abusing power comes with no consequences. A betrayal of the legal process by those sworn to defend it. The lack of accountability and credibility is immense, yet the American public at large seem to not really care. Why? We'll discuss that in the next section. Education. The single most important part of any civilized society is education. Without a baseline knowledge of facts, history, and critical thinking skills, civil order is unobtainable. Without a good education, people rely on their impulses and emotions to make decisions and become easy to manipulate. I don't have to get into the details of why the American education system is a failure, because it's obvious. 
the American public is dumb as shit. American discourse is based on loyalty and emotion, not fact and procedure. Half of this country has been manipulated into thinking climate change is fake. Half of this country thinks pollution doesn't do anything. Half of this country thinks coronavirus is fake. Half of this country thinks the earth is 6,000 years old. Half of this country supports violence over discourse, and most of the other half doesn't care. I remember in seventh grade, learning about the Romans who poisoned themselves because they drank from lead cups. I remember thinking how dumb they were. We know lead is bad, yet we drink from lead pipes. Our stupidity is aggressively growing. We get our news from organizations that have no credibility. We elect leaders who have conflicts of interest. The American diet is based on cheeseburgers and bacon, and woke people think chemical burgers designed to increase profit margins are the smart alternative. The American public is so dumb, we have been accustomed to being duped and ripped off. Our medical care is subpar, yet it is the most expensive on earth. Our military costs more than the next 20 plus militaries combined, yet we can't win wars. We let the richest pay almost no taxes while their employees pay rent and buy food with welfare money. And most ironically, many Americans who pay for an education or go into decades of debt to obtain one still live with their parents after college because good paying jobs are not being offered. After World War II, everybody said, never forget. And with this mindset, culture blossomed and progress literally skyrocketed. Well, we forgot. The lack of accountability and credibility in our society has led the government and its supportive institutions to set aside their duties to the American people. Both major political parties are riddled with corruption. Republicans rule by manipulating people's fear and anger, and Democrats rule by manipulating people's hopes. Over the past few decades, the vast majority of American people have been coerced into a loss of rights, public service, and wealth. Civility is at its lowest point since the Civil War. Climate change is accelerating. Coronavirus has killed over 400,000 Americans and isn't slowing down. Vast swaths of American people are addicted to legal and illegal drugs. The police are politicized, act as a gang, and allowed a mob to attack the Capitol building while a joint session of Congress was taking place. Systematic racism and classism prevail. A college education doesn't guarantee a good job. Rich people and companies benefit from corporate welfare but don't pay taxes and are above the law. Lawyers successfully argue against the proven truth and subpoenas are ignored without consequence. Low-minded, emotionally based opinions override fact. Wall Street is doing better than it has ever done though. Half the country thinks a guy who grew up shitting on golden toilets wants to solve these problems. And most of the other half thinks a career politician who allowed all this stuff to happen in the first place can solve them. What most Americans care about the most though is two-day delivery and extra cheese. Looking at the past, it is natural for societies to subject their peoples to unnecessary hardships and to rise and fall. However, the United States was built so people could live free in a system that would endure. American values led to unprecedented advancements in culture, understanding, and progress. It's sad to watch our society stop putting energy into the systems that allow new ideas and complexity to rise. We are witnessing the de-evolution of our society back to the natural resting state of human nature, where aggression and violence rule. This has happened to many societies before, but this time, it's different. It's different now because we have weapons that can destroy the planet, and even if we don't use our weapons, our way of life will. The very air we breathe, and the ground we live on, is at stake. What we do here, in this country, the most powerful, most knowledgeable, most influential country that has ever existed, determines the fate of the human race. I see a path to solving these problems. Step 1. Elect leaders that care. Obviously, the GOP is essentially a third world regime and the Democrats are full of shit. It shocks me how people are all about Joe Biden when it was him and his style of Democrat that allowed the radicalization of the GOP and the rise of Trump. Both parties hate AOC, Bernie Sanders, Andrew Yang, etc. for a reason. They seem like a good place to start. Pro tip, don't listen to what anybody has to say about them. Look and see for yourself. Step 2. Enforce the law fairly and evenly. 
This will remove most of the bad actors from the situation and act as a deterrent. Step 3. Audit everything. Audit every government department and every company that has deep ties to the government. This will root out more crime and save shitloads of money down the road. Step 3. Reform everything. Reform transit systems so they work. Reform prison systems so they rehabilitate. Reform healthcare so people don't have to become an addict because they broke their arm. Reform the police so all people can go about their business without being afraid. Reform tax code so everybody pays their fair share and social programs are funded. Reform the banking and credit systems because 32% interest is insane. Reform education so the public at large regains critical thinking skills, etc., etc. You get the point. Just do the right thing. Doing this will be hard, but it would create a lot of opportunities. It has been done in the past. We can do it again. I'm calling this section semi-pragmatic because I believe and hope this stuff can happen, but I really don't think it's going to. I see a clear path to solving these problems. Embrace the concept of cosmic evolution. I touched upon this in my previous video. The Alpracus worldview. In order to survive, we must suppress our willfulness and spend more and more energy in order to sustain and make more complex systems. We have some energy stored right now, but ultimately, all our energy comes from the sun. So let's start there. First, we use what energy and scientific knowledge we have right now to build a sustainable agriculture system that produces healthy food. We take this healthy food and feed it to children who will use those calories to study the basics. As they grow, they should spend their calories studying the achievements and failures of the past and learning critical thinking skills. Then, as they get older and form interests, they spend more and more energy mastering the complex systems already in existence. Then, they spend more energy building new, more complex, more effective systems than the ones that already exist. Maintain old systems until they become obsolete. That is progress. American government and society did the same thing. In a letter to his wife Abigail Adams, written by John Adams, on May 12, 1780, he said, I must study politics and war, that my sons have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children the right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Energy must be spent learning about the past, or the past will be forgotten, and mistakes will repeat themselves. And that is all I got to say about that. This is our practice. And if you want to live forever, like and subscribe.